Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Dan Novak has the education report. He looks at trade schools, those that teach car repair or electrical work. Some students are more interested in trade schools than other colleges because they are learning job skills. Following Dan, Ana Mateo is here with words and their stories. She tells us about an expression that makes me think of a very strong animal in a small store. Then, Kelly Jean Kelly brings us the next part in our series on America's presidents. This week, William Henry Harrison. But first, here's Gregory Stockel with this item about Tunisia's water troubles. Because of severely dry conditions, Tunisia has ordered water to be rationed, with little warning to the people there. Water is to be cut off for seven hours a day, from nine o'clock in the evening to four o'clock in the morning, in most areas of the country, including Tunis, the capital. The order will last from April until September. Those who do not ration water risk fines or jail time. Households now need a supply of bottled water to wash, use toilets, and prepare meals during late night hours. Officials have also banned using drinking water on farms, green areas in cities. And for cleaning streets and cars, Agriculture Ministry spokesperson Rauda Dredi said the order applies to all areas connected to the state-owned water system. Dredi added, "It does not include rural areas that do not get their water from the state system." Water levels at almost all of Tunisia's dams have decreased. Some dams hold as little as 17 percent of possible storage. Currently, we have reached the red line, the danger line in terms of water scarcity," said Amen Hamem. Hamem is a member of an environmental group. In the coastal town of Manzal Tamim, which has a dam nearby, Tunisia is mostly desert. Temperatures can reach 40 degrees Celsius in parts of the country. The country is also facing an economic crisis. Political tensions last year. Delayed talks with the International Monetary Fund for a 1.8 billion dollar loan agreement to help finance the government. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development said Tunisia is facing inflation of around 11 percent and food supplies are low. The water rationing comes during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, when people enjoy big meals after sunset and water use increases. Ramadan is nearly over, but summer and the start of tourist season, when foreign visitors come, will increase demand for water. Tunisia depends on tourism for income. The country of 12 million people has around 850 hotels. Many are near the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Ministry spokesperson Dridi said hotels and hospitals 
keep reserves of water that they fill during the day and use when water is not running. The fine for washing cars or other banned uses is between $20 to $320. Those actions also risk prison time of between six days to nine months. Reports say those who illegally use water can have their supply cut off by the state-owned water company, Soned. Radia Esamin is with a group called the Tunisian Water Observatory. She said the decision to cut the water supply was not surprising. But she said it should have been carried out differently so that people could have prepared themselves. That is why we consider these measures incomplete. Before taking any measures, the citizens must be made aware of the importance of water rationing, she said. A booklet should have been published explaining water consumption, storage, timing, and the quantity allowed to be stored. Abdul Qadr Hamisi lives outside Tunis. He said many people were caught by surprise by both the dry weather and measures to cut water use. He was not. Hamisi said he built a water tank two years ago and now shares his supply. We found the solution in this tank, and my brothers and neighbors use it too. Hamisi said. I'm Gregory Stockel. Almost every area of higher education in the United States has fewer students registering for classes, but many trade programs are growing. Trade programs teach students skills for specific jobs, like electricians or car repair. For many students, Skilled trades offer a clearer path to a job. The National Student Clearinghouse says from spring 2021 to 2022, some trade programs grew as much as 19.3%. Meanwhile, the overall number of students declined by 7.8% at public two-year colleges and about 3.4% at public four-year colleges. That is the case in the American state of Tennessee. Despite having free tuition since 2015, the overall number of students going to the state's community colleges declined during the pandemic. But at the Tennessee College of Applied Technology, or TCAT, many trade programs have continued to grow. TCAT is a network of 24 colleges that offers training for 70 different jobs. At TCAT Nashville, several programs have waiting lists. The college has added night classes to meet demand, said Nathan Garrett, president of the college. TCAT centers on training students for jobs that are in demand in the area. Garrett said the pandemic made certain jobs more desirable. When we look at essential workers, a lot of those trades never saw a slowdown, he said. They still hired. They still have the need. Trevin Jones is attending an automotive trade school at the TCAT in Nashville. The 26-year-old said when he was in high school, he did not know what he wanted to do. He said that his biggest fear was to go to college, put in all that time and effort, and then not use my degree. Robert Nivayo said he did not like high school, but he knew what he wanted to do earlier in life. He spent most of his free time watching videos about fixing up cars before he was old enough to drive. Training in car repair made sense for him, he said, because he could earn a working document while doing what he enjoyed. 
Now nineteen, Nivayo looks forward to the money he will earn when he gets a job in an auto shop. He can expect to make about forty thousand dollars to sixty thousand dollars a year. His instructor said. Laura Monks is the president of TCAT Shelbyville. She said one of the reasons students like TCAT is the school's co-op program. It gives students who are close to finishing their studies a chance to get real work experience toward their degree. Braden Johnson, twenty, is studying industrial maintenance automation. As part of the co-op program, he works as an electrical maintenance technician in a local factory that makes containers for toothpaste. Johnson earns twenty-six dollars an hour and hopes to stay in the job after he finishes at TCAT this spring. Garrett of Nashville said to get real work experience in TCAT's co-op program. Is important. He noted that the employer reports back to the student's instructor, so they know where the student is doing well and where they are struggling. That way, they can work on those weaknesses in class. For Chevin Jones, his plan is to fix up his car by the time he finishes the trade program, and have fun while doing it. It's school, and I take it seriously. But you know, you come here, and it just feels more like you're at a shop, hanging out with your homies all day. Jones said, "It's a good feeling." I'm Dan Novak. Have you ever felt out of place? Have you ever felt clumsy, like you cannot move gracefully and smoothly? If you answered yes. Then today's show is for you. Today we talk about what happens when a big animal runs loose in a small area. The expression is to be a bull in a china shop. China is fragile, meaning very easy to break. Imagine a large bull running loose in a china shop. All the fragile plates, bowls, and teacups would be on the floor, and broken in a million pieces. So, a bull in a china shop describes a person who is awkward and clumsy. Wherever they go, they make a mess. This can happen on purpose or on accident. If you are behaving wildly in a small space and are breaking things here and there, you are acting like a bull in a china shop. But maybe you don't mean to. Maybe you are just very big, or your body movements are not very graceful. This expression can describe a person or a situation. For example, a fancy wedding is my bull in a china shop situation. I always end up knocking something over or saying the wrong thing. This expression is used in other ways. When a person feels out of place and deals too roughly with a delicate problem, they can say they feel like a bull in a china shop. If you are this kind of person, you do not handle light situations well at all. For some reason, and sometimes through no fault of your own, you just make things worse. It can also mean you rush into a situation without thinking about it clearly. Acting like a bull in a china shop. Means recklessly attacking a problem without proper planning. So when you act like a bull in a china shop, you create damage. You leave a big mess in your wake. This could be an actual mess, or a figurative one. 
For example, if you are a bull in a china shop, you may not be invited to a problem-solving meeting at work. You may bring a little too much mayhem with you. This expression can also mean you handle a delicate situation badly. You don't react calmly and carefully. Instead, you add fuel to the fire. This means you make the situation worse. For example, when it comes to relationship issues, Deidre is like a bull in a china shop. She always ends up making more trouble. One time, she tried to help a married couple who had been arguing a lot. After Deidre's help, the couple ended their marriage. It is widely believed that this expression came from real animals, causing real damage at outdoor markets in the 1800s. Word experts say that many languages have a similar expression, but maybe they use a different animal. For example, an elephant. An elephant would also do a lot of damage in a china shop. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Thank you, Anna. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English Broadcast. We are joined now by Anna Mateo. I never would have guessed she sometimes feels like a bull in a china shop. Welcome, Anna. Thanks, Dan. I'm glad to be here. Anna, why do you sometimes feel like a bull in a china shop? Well, Dan, I am very tall. I am 1.8 meters tall. And I'm clumsy. If I walk into a very large room and there is one piece of furniture in it, I will run into it. So sometimes I feel like a bull in a china shop. Anna, that makes sense. I know you are tall, but your story also makes a good point. The expression does not always have to do with size, even though bulls are large animals. I think sometimes... I put my foot in my mouth, which is like the example you used in the episode of a person offering bad marriage advice. Are there any other body parts this expression makes you think of? Oh, sure. You can say someone is all thumbs. If you can imagine only having thumbs, you would drop things all the time. And if you're handling costly plates and cups. You do not want to break them. And if you have two left feet, you are really bad at dancing. You're clumsy when you dance. That's right. That's a good one. Thanks for joining us today, Anna. You're welcome, Dan. Today we are talking about William Henry Harrison. Although he was elected in 1840, Many Americans still remember his catchy campaign slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler Too. For Tippecanoe and Tyler Too. For Tippecanoe and Tyler Too. Tyler referred to John Tyler, Harrison's partner on the ticket. In other words, Harrison was the candidate for president, and Tyler was the candidate for vice president. That seems straightforward enough. But Tippecanoe? That was Harrison's nickname. It came from a battle he had fought nearly 30 years before the presidential campaign. At that time, Harrison led troops against an alliance of Native American tribes. The alliance was fighting white American settlers who were taking Native people's territory. Harrison and his men wanted to prevent the alliance from getting the supplies and warriors it needed to fight a long war. 
They plan to attack an important Native American base in what is today the state of Indiana. But Native American warriors attacked first. They struck at dawn, when Harrison's men were still sleeping in a camp near the river Tippecanoe. The battle was confused and bloody. Many fighters on both sides died. It was not really clear who won, but Harrison declared victory. His presidential campaign reminded voters about the battle. The nickname Tippecanoe suggested Harrison was a simple yet tough Westerner who would fight for white Americans. But that image of Harrison was not entirely true. Harrison did not come from a simple Western family. Instead, he was the youngest child of a wealthy family from the southern state of Virginia. The Harrisons were active in the politics of the young nation. His father signed the Declaration of Independence and became the governor of Virginia. Young William Harrison received a good education, but he did not want to become a doctor or lawyer. He joined the military instead. Harrison succeeded quickly as an army officer. He earned a reputation as an able leader in fights against Native Americans. Harrison became the governor of what was known as Indiana Territory. In that job, he persuaded Native Americans to enter into treaties that sold their land to the U.S. government, often for very little money. Harrison's insistence on securing land for white settlers was one reason Native American tribes formed an alliance against the United States. A member of the Shawnee tribe, Tecumseh, was one of their most prominent leaders. It was Tecumseh's men who fought against Harrison in the Battle of Tippecanoe. Tecumseh's men clashed again with Harrison during the War of 1812 at a battle in Ontario, Canada, near the River Thames. In that battle, both the British and Native Americans were clearly defeated. Tecumseh was killed. After that, the Native American alliance fell apart, and Harrison became famous again. Although Harrison was a well-known fighter against Native Americans, he could not find lasting success as a politician. He served briefly in both the House of Representatives and the Senate, but he did not stay in those positions long. He struggled with debt. His home in Indiana was very expensive. He also had to provide for his ten children. The emotional cost of his family was also high. Only four of his children lived past the age of 40. In 1836, Harrison's fortunes seemed to change. A new party, called the Whigs, looked to him as a presidential candidate. The Whigs strongly opposed President Andrew Jackson and his policies. They did not want Jackson's vice president and right-hand man, Martin Van Buren, to become president. But they understood that Jackson was very popular with everyday Americans. So the Whigs thought that Harrison, a military hero from the West, just as Jackson was, would appeal to voters. At the time, voting was limited mostly to white men. The Whigs nominated Harrison as one of their candidates. Harrison did well, but not well enough. Van Buren won the 1836 election, but the next election belonged to Harrison. 
His campaign developed that memorable song about Tippecanoe and Tyler, too. Supporters also turned an insult against Harrison into an advantage. Harrison's opposition said he would be happy to spend the rest of his life just sitting in a log cabin and drinking hard cider, an alcoholic drink made from apples. The opposition wanted to suggest that Harrison was not really interested in becoming president and working hard for the American people. But Harrison's supporters used the images of a log cabin and hard cider to portray Harrison as a humble man who could relate to common Americans. The plan was a success. Harrison won the election. Sure, let him talk about hard cider, 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 and log cabins, too. Will only help to speed the ball for Tippecanoe and Tyler too. For Tippecanoe and Tyler too. And with them will beat little Van. Van. Van is a used up man. And with them will beat little Van. At 68, Harrison was the oldest person yet to take office. On his inauguration day, he reportedly wanted to show that he was strong enough to serve as president by delivering a very long speech without wearing a coat or hat. Several weeks later, Harrison became sick. He complained of many problems, anxiety, fatigue, and pain in his stomach. His health grew worse and worse. One month after he was sworn in, Harrison died. It was the first time in the country's history that a president had died in office. The event raised many questions about who would become president. That question is answered in the next episode of this series. For future generations, it also raised a question about what Harrison died of. The traditional story is that his long inaugural speech led to a fatal pneumonia. But researchers in 2014 proposed a different reason. Jane McHugh and Philip Makoviak wrote in the New York Times that while Harrison was in office, Washington, D.C. did not have a good sewer system. Human waste simply flowed onto public grounds a short distance from the White House. The researchers conclude that Harrison probably died from problems related to drinking dirty water in the president's house. So, for Harrison, winning the White House may not have been good fortune at all. <laughs> 